pornography industry has a long criminal history, but that hasn't stopped it from going mainstream. My image has been downloaded 841 million times. There will probably be a minimum of a billion tapes rented or sold in the United States this year. That's a lowball figure. For years, zealous police and prosecutors have tried to stamp out porn, but sometimes their efforts backfire, like the search for the snuff film. Actual human beings die during the filming of this movie. The undercover FBI agent who went in too deep lost his identity and threatened the biggest porn sting ever. The all-time horror story of FBI undercover operations. The obscenity trial that targeted one of the most conservative territories in America. And the investigators lost in cyberspace. I'm Legs McNeil. In four years researching a book on the criminal history of pornography, I've found more than a few factors that led directly to its rise from an outlaw stepchild of Hollywood to a $10 billion a year industry. The most surprising was how the law enforcement agencies that tried to stop the proliferation of porn actually helped take it from the shadows into mainstream American culture. Cyber porn is a, is a you know, fancy word for porn on the internet. Cyberspace is the new frontier in the war against pornography. There's all sorts of material out there, some of it criminal. But because the internet is so vast, it's almost impossible to regulate. The internet is a natural for porn because of the anonymity. You don't have to go into the store and embarrass yourself. Former internet porn manager Evan Wright knows how easy it is to download porn from a home computer. It's also legal. ACLU president Nadine Strassen doesn't see that changing soon. The long-range consequences are not only that cyber censorship law will be unconstitutional, but I think even enforcing traditional obscenity laws online is very much in question now. There are legitimate crimes in cyberspace, from credit card fraud to child pornography. The problem is determining what's criminal and what's victimless fantasy. Whether it's kiddie porn that's actually animation, or websites that paste celebrity heads on naked bodies. But chasing shadows isn't new in the battle against porn. Case in point, a 30-year wild goose chase that's ended in failure. The search for the snuff film. A snuff film is normally a hardcore porno film, except it has one difference at the end of it. And it's a big difference. A snuff film takes porn one terrible step beyond, ending with the actual murder of a performer on camera. Internet journalist Hogue Levins got the FBI's complete 103-page file on the snuff probe through the Freedom of Information Act. The FBI file suggests that the first documented uh, report of a snuff film occurred in 1969 on a beach in California. The snuff film on the beach was supposedly shot by Charles Manson and his family. No one ever found the film or could prove it was made, but those first whispers led the FBI to put Bill Kelly it's porn expert on the case. As far as snuff is concerned, I was in it from the, the get-go. This is the way it was set up. Uh, a sergeant in mid-Manhattan Vice, New York City, had an underworld informant who came to him one day and he said, Sergeant Horman, there are allegedly a series of 8 millimeter black and white motion picture films and one of the female participants is actually, truly murdered by having her throat slit. Now these films are allegedly for sale for $1,500. Do you want me to buy them if I can find them? Well, Horman called the FBI office in New York. He said, well, we don't know anything about it, but let me call that Irish guy down in Miami. He may be able to tell you something. And so they called me and he said, do uh, you know anything about this? I'd never heard of it. Said, Can you find out? I said, sure. Just go ahead. 
The FBI's interest in snuff films is pretty clear. The concept that someone would actually film a murder, and in fact, some of the FBI agents we talked to suggested that actually finding a snuff film was like the holy grail. The snuff rumors spread at a time when pornography was playing to a larger audience. In the 70s, porn films like Deep Throat played in legitimate theaters. And with Hollywood making very edgy sexual films of its own, the groups that wanted to stamp out smut needed a weapon. Nothing would be more powerful than the argument that porn was not only exploitative, it was actually murder. It was a very frustrating argument to porn veterans like Bill Margul. How many people do you think I could do that to, and I start running out of people, or the word gets out, I'm butchering these people, how many people are going to come to casting calls if they know they're going to leave in different pieces? And it wasn't only the conservatives who were popularizing the snuff rumors. Hollywood had a part. The FBI file suggests that uh, one of the rumors of snuff films came from uh, Dennis Hopper. Dennis Hopper. The actor and director allegedly told someone he'd seen a snuff movie when he was shooting a film in South America. The FBI also investigated Sammy Davis Jr. Both leads went nowhere, and the search went on. I had probably the second best informant in the FBI on obscenity. Los Angeles having the best. I called this guy in and I said, uh, would you be willing to travel the country to find these? And if you can find them, buy them, bring them back. Sure. So I gave him a pile of money, which local police officers can't ordinarily do. He went to, I don't remember how many cities, but he covered the country pretty well. He was gone quite a while. He came back and he said, Kelly, it's strictly a rumor. He said, if they were out there, I'd have them for you. I don't think they exist. So I reported to headquarters that snuff at that time, as far as film was concerned, was a rumor. And snuff remained a rumor until late 1975 with the announcement that an actual snuff film was about to be made public. Monarch Releasing began to prepare to release uh, an actual movie that they uh, suggested was a snuff film and in fact its title was Snuff. Monarch Releasing was actually one man a cheapo movie producer named Alan Shackleton. Alan Shackleton did, uh, was a guy who was on uh, uh, the low end of the feeding chain. But like Al Goldstein of Screw Magazine, Shackleton knew how to cash in on publicity. He began by paying off some police sources to spread the snuff rumor to the New York City newspapers. Once he got everyone talking about snuff, he started promoting his movie around the country. According to the FBI file, Monarch Releasing and Alan Shackleton went city by city and promoted this film in advertisements. From South America where life is cheap. There are a copy of those advertisements in the FBI file. Snuff, snuff. Actual human beings die during the filming of this movie. Monarch Releasing appeared to hope that by placing ads and then uh, showing this movie, that there would be a community outcry. The FBI files suggest that. And that that outcry would spread free publicity across the country and pull them by the droves into the theater. Anti-pornography groups just swarmed all over this film and created this uh, insane backlash. They were calling it the bloodiest thing ever filmed. Shackleton drummed up more outrage by giving his picture an X rating. Finally, after all the rumors, all the protests and all the time spent investigating, the movie called Snuff was unleashed across America, and the FBI was ready to shut it down. You're lucky we didn't kill you today. If it wasn't for Satan, we would have. Don't worry, in a few weeks we'll be back to normal. And it opened in Indianapolis in 1976, and despite the ads that they ran in the paper, a total of 12 people came to that uh, showing, and five of the 12, according to the FBI file, were law enforcement officers, including an FBI pathologist. And the pathologist and the FBI agents watched the film, and they concluded that, in fact, it was simply a theatrical simulation. It was not a murder. The film called Snuff back in 76 was basically a fake snuff film. Alan Shackleton's movie wasn't a snuff film after all. It was a violent biker flick titled Slaughter that he altered and renamed Snuff. Writer Jack Bulware knows how he did it. He tacked on some additional footage that he shot that was gratuitous. 
It was terribly done. But what he did is he put those two movies together, called it Snuff. The movie Slaughter originally ended with this scene. What are you up to, you two? Uh, 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 I'll blow your brains out. Come on, get out of there fast. Let me alone. Uh! Shackleton turns slaughter into snuff by shooting a new scene and adding it to the end of the movie. All right, cut. This is the new ending, shot in a New York City loft. It has nothing to do with the rest of the movie. That was dynamite. That was a gory scene, you know, that really turned me on. The man playing the director supposedly kills the leading lady while the camera crew films the murder. Somehow, we get to see the camera crew filming. Scream! Go on, scream! Scream! Snuff ends when the film supposedly runs out. Run out of film. Did you get it? Did you get it all? Yeah, yeah, we got it all. Yeah, let's get out of here. I went to see it. It was obviously a phony. I mean, nobody got killed. Evidently, word that Snuff was a fake didn't spread after the premiere in Indianapolis. Because a month later, Snuff opened in New York City in Times Square, complete with protesters. One of the things the FBI reported in the uh, New York uh, City uh, screening was that the film, for some odd reason, was coupled with other films about the Amish and, I believe, extraterrestrials. So it was a really weird mix, and perhaps it was an attempt to broaden the audience appeal. Who knows? The outcry against snuff was immediate. The Manhattan DA actually went and saw the movie, and he came to the same conclusion as everyone else. The film was a fraud. Nobody got killed. But it didn't matter, because the decency groups now had their secret weapon against porn. People were picking it and saying, this is the real thing. I said, yeah, it's real if you believe that people are made out of Goodyear rubber. But this myth remained for years. People would whisper, my God, they make snuff movies. These are even worse than straight porn movies. They're horrible. People die in them. And of course, none of them existed. The effect was undeniable. The group Women Against Pornography was formed expressly to protest the movie Snuff. The rumors helped lead to President Reagan's Mies Commission. And the FBI continued to chase down snuff film rumors for 25 years. So I've had a, a, a reward for 20 years, a million dollars my lawyer has in escrow. If anyone ever comes out with a snuff film, if they can come up with a snuff film, I will give them a million dollars. Now it should be noted that cameras have captured gruesome news footage and that companies have compiled and marketed those videos. Sex sells, death sells well. But no one has ever come up with anything that fits the FBI's definition of the holy grail, the snuff film. The real story about snuff films is, according to the FBI, there's not much of a story. Still ahead, the government's most extensive investigation into the powers behind pornography and how it was almost derailed by one man. During the course of the undercover operation, it became apparent that Pat was becoming too good at what he was doing. The outrage over snuff helped lead to the FBI's Operation My Porn, an elaborate investigation and sting aimed at porn distributors in cities across the country. My porn was the biggest crackdown on porn and crime in FBI history. But all it took was one agent to turn it into the biggest embarrassment. This investigation included the inquiry into uh, the illegal activities of the pornography business in the United States. My porn is an acronym that stands for Miami Pornography. It was the first time that I was aware of that the FBI had gone uh, to that extent, uh, expending a great deal of time and effort to try and penetrate organized crime. At the time, these organized crime figures were the most active pornographers in the world. I have some photographs of some of these people from the My Porn prosecutions to show you. This is the godfather or the head of the Perino gang, Anthony Joseph Perino. His younger brother, Joe the Whale Perino, 
Robert D. Bernardo, also known as DB, a Gambino family capo. Noel Charles Bloom, probably the second or third most important pornographer in the United States. The world's most important pornographer of all time, Rubens Thurman. The two people who did the most, really, in terms of the undercover operation were Special Agent Bruce Olafsky and Special Agent Patrick Livingston of the FBI. Olafsky and Livingston. U.S. Attorney Marcella Cohen Auerbach worked with them as they gathered evidence. Bill Brown was the lawyer for their undercover characters. And FBI agent Bill Kelly trained them. Pat Livingston was hired on by the FBI here in Miami as a clerk right out of high school. Excellent employee, hard worker, smart little guy. Uh, he, he's a very unlikely looking guy to be an FBI agent. He's short, he was almost bald, he was kind of bow-legged, he had a list, but he could whip your tail right into the ground. He was a tough little guy. I met him in the early 60s. We were in a group called the Coastal Forces. It was a Coast Guard reserve unit in Florida for, to watch for infiltrators of, from Cuba. In the mid-70s, he came to me and said that he was going into a deep undercover operation to infiltrate the pornography industry with uh, another agent, Bruce Wakely. His real name was Alaski. In his long tenure running the FBI, J. Edgar Hoover rarely let agents go undercover with the mob. He was afraid they'd be compromised. Pat Livingston was among the very first. He realized if they were going to be successful in convincing the organized crime people that he and Bruce were legitimate small-time pornographers, that they had to have a lawyer on call. And uh, I was, of course, a practicing lawyer in Miami. So in view of our relationship, he asked me if I would work with him, and I agreed to do that. They came in here in August of 1977, and my job was to train the both of them as to how to be pornographers. Well, I'd never done that before. I knew how to be a pornographer, but I'd never trained anybody. I told them who the target should be, the major guys, uh, and what mistakes not to make. Don't ask for kiddie porn, because they're going to know you're a cop if you do that. Uh, don't pay $60 for a tape that you get wholesale for 40 Livingston and Olafsky had to learn to play characters 24 hours a day. They're diametrically opposed characters. Olafsky looks like an accountant and acts like one. Pat Livingston is sort of a bebopping type of guy. You know, he's, he's always running around. His undercover name was uh, Pat Salamone. The Pat Salamone character was a small-time hood, a wise guy involved in several shady operations from gun selling to fencing stolen property. I think I had a, a practical understanding of uh, what it takes to put together a, a uh, successful uh, undercover operation. I also have the practical background of knowing uh, what problems to go. Pat Livingston and Bruce Olavsky set up a clothing company called Gold Coast Specialties. But that was just the cover for us being pornographers. The front operation was uh, pretty much uh, a store with jeans in the front and in the back is where they conducted uh, their meetings and had their uh, undercover operation. We also had an electronics genius who wired that office beautifully with uh, sound and video cameras. Couldn't see or anything. It was a perfect setup. Bring the pornographers in there and make the deals with them. Livingston and Olafsky were now Salamone and Wakerly, and soon they were wheeling and dealing with big-time pornographers and distributors buying, selling, and shipping porn across state lines. It was amazing in terms of the number of people they were meeting and the incredible evidence they were gathering. It was frightening as well. As far as I'm concerned, if they were exposed, they would have been dead. Well, when you're dealing with people in a Gambino family and the Colombo family, you're naturally in danger. These guys will kill you. My life was uh, 24 hours a day uh, with wine, women, uh, uh, organized crime people, putting deals together. Uh, and the Bureau provided uh, carte blanche uh, money and, and travel. One thing that the pornographers tried to do, they tried to uh, sick prostitutes on them as favors. 
Well, you know, how do you obviate something like that? Uh, that would be terribly embarrassing if it turned out in court that these two agents were having sexual liaisons with hookers that the pornographers gave them. Eventually, they got two very nice-looking lady FBI agents. Fortunately, we had some at that time to travel with these guys as their girlfriends. Livingston and Olavsky were getting the goods on the mobsters and moguls who distributed all kinds of allegedly obscene materials. Everything from movies like Deep Throat and Debbie Does Dallas to 8mm loops in those Swedish erotica shorts. But for Pat Livingston, the charade was working too well. During the course of the undercover operation, it became apparent that something unusual was going on. Pat was becoming too good at what he was doing. His undercover personality was starting to spill over into the personal relationship that we had. It made me believe that he was undergoing some kind of psychological uh, change. When we come back, Pat Livingston goes so far undercover as pornographer Pat Salamone, he can't find his way out. Operation My Porn was the FBI's attempt to round up and put away all the kingpins who ran the porn industry in the United States. And most all the evidence had been gathered by two undercover agents, Bruce Olavsky and his partner, Pat Livingston. On February 14, 1980, there were simultaneous search warrants conducted at 30 locations in 16 cities throughout the United States. The FBI and the Attorney General of the United States made a press release from Washington, D.C. a few moments ago announcing the conclusion of a two and a half year undercover investigation by the FBI captioned my porn. Fifty-five individuals were indicted. The feds moved in on good fellows, bad guys, businessmen, and money men. But the 55 arrest warrants only brought in 53 suspects. <laughs> Poor Mickey Zafirano was one of two who got away, so to speak. One of them, a mafia guy from the Bonanno family named Mickey Zafirano, dropped dead while agents were chasing him around New York, 42nd Street, trying to arrest him. The other guy was on a cruise someplace. It was incredibly exciting as a prosecutor. I was out in Los Angeles. Uh, prior to February 14th, I was instructing 200 agents, FBI agents, as to how to conduct searches. It was an incredible experience. During the magistrate's hearings, I was running from courtroom to courtroom. Over 30 people had been arrested in Los Angeles alone, so there was a lot of work to be done. It is probably, the, no doubt, was the biggest thing that the federal government has ever done against obscenity in the United States, and I don't think you'll ever see it again. But there was a problem. Undercover agent Pat Livingston, whose testimony was at the basis of many of these prosecutions, was having trouble. Trouble with reality. I would say that Pat Livingston became his undercover identity. People that pretend all the time uh, tend to run into psychological problems. Uh, Pat was uh, suffered from that. He, he was pretending. Uh, and it got the better of him. He started to lose touch with what was real and what was not real. When Pat Livingston got a commendation from FBI Director William Webster in 1981, it was obvious he was starting to lose touch with reality. This keepsake picture is worth a thousand words. Pat Livingston looked nothing like a clean-cut FBI agent. He was caught in the role, still dressing the part with the goatee, the black shirt, he even wore the flashy diamond horseshoe ring the FBI rented as part of his cover. Then, in November of that year, there was no denying. The My Porn prosecutions were still getting underway when Pat Livingston was arrested in Kentucky. He went into Bacon's department store in a suburb of Louisville and allegedly shoplifted about $150 worth of sporting clothes while he had his four-year-old son out in the parking lot in an FBI car. Uh, I got a call from one of the FBI people saying Pat had been arrested, uh, caught shoplifting, which uh, frankly did not surprise me because I, I knew something weird was going to happen to him. When he was arrested, 
the police came and took him away, he, I, he gave them his Pat Salamone identity. And he had used his undercover name. We never saw it coming. There was no way we could have ever anticipated something like that ever happening. And of course, we had to notify the court and did. We had about a four-day hearing before the federal judge, Judge Spellman, about Livingston and his credibility. And Pat Livingston just couldn't give that judge a straight answer. The judge finally gave up and he said, well, your credibility is gone. Pat Livingston was the linchpin in many my porn prosecutions. But because he wasn't even sure of his own identity, his testimony was useless. Prosecutors had to dismiss some of the cases. Perhaps the biggest defendant that got away, so to speak, was Reuben Sturman. Reuben Sturman was considered to be the most important pornographer of all, a distributor who owned hundreds of porn shops and companies. That was the biggest in the world ever since, and never will be another. And what happened to Pat Livingston, the FBI agent who went in too far? The answer was as traumatic as losing Reuben Sturman. When Pat was arrested for shoplifting in Louisville, he was uh, terminated by the FBI. It was unfair to Pat because he was wounded in the line of duty, psychologically wounded, but no less wounded. And I accused them of shooting the wounded. And that, that accusation, frankly, uh, resonated in the, in the Bureau, and they understood at a certain level that it was true. I would have kicked his tail from here to Butte, Montana. Uh, for the incident at Bacon's department store, but I would not have fired him. I feel devastated that uh, uh, my, uh, you know, to a great extent, my uh, problems have uh, caused the dismissal of indictments in this case. Today, Pat Livingston is working as a golf pro. He says he's not interested in talking about Pat's solemnity anymore. Life goes on. Still ahead? A video store obscenity trial unmasked the surprising new kingpins of porn. In wake of Operation My Porn, the U.S. government continued to chase shadows in its war against pornography. When President Ronald Reagan appointed the Mies Commission to investigate porn in 1985, its mandate was to find a link between porn and violence. Some people have argued that this kind of pornography is a matter of artistic creativity and freedom of expression and so on and so on and they go on with that. Well, it's not. This pornography is ugly and dangerous. The commission veered off into the areas of snuff films and child pornography, neither of which was a major factor in the industry. Mob prosecutions continued, even though the grip of organized crime loosened as the VCR made porn easier to make reproduce and sell. Case in point, in 1980, the average cost of a porn video was $100. By 1990, many could be had for $5. In the 21st century, accessing porn took only a click at the home computer. And the battle to police porn continues. The most unusual took place in an area one might not imagine. Provo, the center of Utah County, the heart of conservative Mormon country. a recent obscenity prosecution in Provo, Utah, which is surely one of the most culturally conservative uh, communities in this entire country. And that's relevant because the definition of obscenity depends on local community standards. Utah County was where Larry Peterman ran a chain of video stores called Movie Buffs. In 1999, he was charged with 15 counts of distributing pornographic material for selling adult videos in a back room. This was not a significant portion of our revenue and this type of publicity. We're a family video store. At his first trial, a jury tried to decide if Larry Peterman was guilty of violating the community standards of Utah County. They spent 15 hours just watching porn videos in the courtroom. But in the end, they were deadlocked and couldn't agree whether these videos violated community standards. Prosecutors decided to try the case again. We've had a number of calls in the office since uh, the mistrial was declared. Those calls are all urging us to, uh, to retry this. If there was reason to bring it in the first place, 
there is reason to retry it. Larry Peterman's attorney seemed to look forward to a second trial, especially a replay of all those sex videos in court. This new jury is going to have to look at all of them. Uh, we'll have a brand new film festival with uh, the same 15 players. But before the retrial got underway, the defense attorney left the case because Larry Peterman could no longer afford to pay him. A public defender named Randy Spencer took over. Randy Spencer was a devout Mormon and no fan of pornography, but he did believe in the law. I believe in the Constitution, I believe in freedom of speech, and, and I believe in acceptance and tolerance of those who may have different views than even I do. And so, it has not been a difficult case to work on. Even though I personally may not choose to watch these videos myself in my own personal life, I would not begrudge someone else who chose differently than I would. The first thing Randy Spencer did was ask to have the judge removed from the case. Some of the statements that Judge Davis had made uh, to um, uh, some members of the jury and other members of the public uh, raised in his mind a question about whether or not uh, Judge Davis was impartial. Then he prepared to spring a surprise. This time, at the second trial, the six-member jury watched 20 hours of porn videos, the ones that were sold at Larry Peterman's store. And this trial attracted even more members of the community as spectators. You're not going to get the average person in Utah County who's going to go down and, and uh, rent videos, which include incest, group sex, and homosexual sex. I mean, it's, it's pretty clear that's not going to happen. Yes, on the surface, it seemed that the videos violated the community standards of Provo and Utah County. But public defender Randy Spencer had a brainstorm when he looked out the courthouse window to the hotel across the street. He sent an investigator to the Provo Marriott to count up all the sex movies people could buy through pay-per-view channels in their hotel rooms. And then he took a close look at the viewing habits of the county that called itself the most conservative in America. So this lawyer had the insight that he would try to prove what local community standards were by doing surveys and getting information on what people were accessing through advanced technology that was directly going into their home, such as satellite technology and cable TV channels. Randy Spencer found out that people in Utah County ordered 20,000 adult videos from one satellite programmer alone in the same period that Larry Peterman allegedly broke the law. And he was able to show that the consumption of sexual material was actually much higher in Mormon County, Utah, this supposedly very conservative, sexually uh, inhibited venue, than it was in other places. The consumption of satellite porn in Provo was actually double the volume of most American cities the same size. When that information was presented to the jury, it took them only a few minutes to acquit the video store owner on the obscenity charges. I don't know what it was that hung them up or or made them decide that this was not pornographic but um, it was our opinion that it was. It tells me that there are a lot of people in this community that are viewing the material and that accept and tolerate it. Well before this kind of study was done and before the advent of technology that allowed people privately to access sexual images, I think it was uh, a lot easier for people to engage in hypocrisy. A simple phone call to have said they had a problem with any particular movies uh, would have sufficed. Uh, we were res responsible business people. We tried to run our business according to the wishes of our customers and a 25 cent phone call would have saved millions or hundreds of thousands of dollars I guess and time and not have ruined a lot of people. And there was one more very telling conclusion of the defense attorney's survey of Provo, Utah's viewing habits. The biggest providers of pornography in Utah County and ultimately across America are the satellite and cable companies owned by the largest corporations. Major companies are getting into adult entertainment now because it's becoming more profitable. I, I, I think really think the big players have always been involved. It's because there's a demand for it. And it wouldn't be intelligent for any business to eliminate that whole sector of their, of their market. This young man should know what he's talking about. He's one of the biggest porn providers of the Internet age. 
and he's also the latest target of the smut fighters, who've gone in wrong directions while the porn industry grew even larger. When we come back, meet the porn impresario of the next generation. With the advent of the internet, the shape of porn is totally different than it was 30 years ago. But the law enforcement agencies who try to regulate porn turn to the same techniques time and again. Even today, as porn thrives in a new millennium, the laws most often used against pornographers go back to the charges that brought down Al Capone. Tax evasion charges. In the 70s, they were used against the mobsters who ran the industry. In the 80s, it was porn kingpin Reuben Sturman. In the 90s, porn stars like Ginger Lynn Allen and Tom Byron. And now, in the 21st century, the one they call the boy wonder of cyber porn. This is Seth Warshawski. He's known for his youth and a nervous tick that's become a trademark. <coughs> Warshawski is the Larry Flint of cyber porn. I know, Seth. I, I think he's a jerk. He's a little too young to handle what he's dealing with. You know, I don't think I'd ever be prepared to go to jail to, to you know, like, like Larry Flint would in order to, you know, preserve my rights or to make a statement. I think that IEG has always been a very conservative company when it comes to the type of content that we're putting out there. Yeah, let's get naked. <laughs> Seth Warshawski virtually launched a new porn industry when his company, Internet Entertainment Group, began selling the pirated, allegedly stolen Pamela Anderson, Tommy Lee sex tape online. I think everybody's got a little bit of, you know, voyeur in them. I, you know, everybody to different extents. Uh, I mean, I think it's just natural. Warshawski got his start working with telephones. I wasn't even old enough to call a phone sex line. I was like 17 years old. It's kind of funny. He was a, a hacker when he was a kid. Uh, not necessarily a criminal hacker, just meant someone who was skilled with computers. And he was a phone freaker. Kids that would break into the phone system and figure out how to make um, illegal calls. And Seth got in trouble with the phone company. According to my source who worked for the phone company, when he's about 16, 17, Seth discovers phone sex. His business grew phenomenally. Evan Wright was an editor for Larry Flint's Hustler magazine when he was hired away by Seth Warshawski to manage his internet sites. Warshawski's right-hand man would become his most vocal public critic. By the time he was 20, he was chairman and founder of his own long-distance telephone company, which he created in order to make money off of phone sex. That company was doing in excess of $50 million a year. Within about a year of that great success, it, his phone sex operation fell under some regulatory pressures from the government, and he and some of his co-workers became interested in the Internet. You know, I, I think our first real breakthrough, breakthrough was in January of 1996 when we first launched um, clublove.com, which was the first commercial uh, adult website on the Internet. Club Love made millions by charging people's credit cards to access the site and see sex videos and photos featuring celebrities like Pamela Anderson. But for all the publicity and customers, Evan Wright says the company was not as successful as it seemed. At IEG, I was the, the, uh, the executive editor of all of his websites, both adult and non-adult. And uh, it was just a, an incredible scene because all of these reporters were being trotted through the company and he was showing them how great it was and saying he, was, he had, you know, sales were going to be $100 million a year. Well, at the same time, inside the company, paychecks were bouncing creditors were hounding him. They were actually showing up and threatening to beat him up in the hallways of the company. Soon it was reported that the FBI and IRS were investigating Warshawski and his company for double billing credit cards of subscribers and for tax evasion. 
I quit IEG because I was afraid of going to jail working at that company. After I left the company, um, I was sued by Seth Warshawski. He was, he was angry that I left the company. So far, Seth Warshawski has not been charged. Yet the federal scrutiny fits a pattern, as does the increasing success of the porn industry as the federal fight wages on. In history, I think a lot of people in adult business have been in positions where they've been you know, harassed by the government, they've been become targets um, uh, because of their profile, um, and the government you know, unnecessarily um, and, and really without merit put a lot of pressure and uh, strain on their lives and businesses. And I, you know, I hope um, that the government is, is beyond that now, and I hope that, that they're acting more you know, they will behave more like, a, like, a, like an upfront entity, except by, you, you never know. Still ahead, the future of porn, crime, and the mainstream. I just recently got the Guinness World Record for being the most downloaded woman on the internet. Um, my image has been downloaded 841 million times. Conservatively, that's actually only counting downloads from my own website. I think the concept of illegal obscenity is a particularly vulnerable concept in the internet context because it depends on this notion of local community standards. But on the internet, there is a voluntarily constituted community of individuals who are seeking out that material. Presumably, they're not offended by it. The future of porn seems unlimited on the internet. Easy to access, tough to regulate. And the new kingpins? anyone with a camera and a website. With the advent of the internet, the genie's out of the bottle. Today, the government is unable to control the information, and they find this extremely threatening. Hi, everybody. Welcome back to In Bed with Danny. I'm Danny. Danny Ash is a good example of the way the new porn industry operates. She runs her own multi-million dollar website, Danny's hard drive. People pay to log on to the site and look at the most downloaded woman on the internet. Danny Ash never has to leave the cocoon of her web studio to go one-on-one -on -one with her fans at home. You're all penthouse pets, right? Right, yeah, all four of us. Danny's hard drive has been very successful. All along, it's been a very profitable business, and it, it's grown steadily every year. Um, last year, we made $5 million, and this year, I expect somewhere around $7 million. Um, it just keeps getting bigger. But Danny Ash has a secret. It was crime that drove her to the internet. I had actually started out in the business as what they call a house dancer. I was arrested for bearing my breast in public. I was arrested on stage. I spent the night in jail and I knew I had to take control of my life and my career and that was when I decided to move on to the internet. Today, Danny Ash is a CEO. The money her one site brings in each month equals the total retail value of the entire porn industry 30 years ago. From sleazy movie theaters, to special sections of video stores, to home video cameras, to a personal computer in the privacy of one's home. Despite the efforts of law enforcement agencies, porn has become corporate, mainstream, and an enormous growth industry. I, I think porn is definitely becoming more mainstream in, in America. I, I, I think if you, you know, a perfect example of, of a crossover product is the Pamela Anderson and Tommy Lee video um, that we put out. It was the largest selling adult video in history. Is pornography a, a, a legitimate? Of course. Pornography is with a $14 billion r revenue flow. Again, go to Las Vegas and you'll see 3,000 people. The adult video news gives out awards. I mean, it's amazing. You have these women giggling. They just had sex with 12 people, and they get this medal, and they thank their mother and father. And the winner is... And the winner is... And I want to thank my mom and my dad and... Um...
pornography industry has a long criminal history, but that hasn't stopped it from going mainstream. My image has been downloaded 841 million times. There will probably be a minimum of a billion tapes rented or sold in the United States this year. That's a lowball figure. For years, zealous police and prosecutors have tried to stamp out porn, but sometimes their efforts backfire. Like the search for the snuff film. Actual human beings die during the filming of this movie. The undercover FBI agent who went in too deep lost his identity and threatened the biggest porn sting ever. The all-time horror story of FBI undercover operations. The obscenity trial that targeted one of the most conservative territories in America. And the investigators lost in cyberspace. I'm Legs McNeil. In four years researching a book on the criminal history of pornography, I've found more than a few factors that led directly to its rise from an outlaw stepchild of Hollywood to a $10 billion a year industry. The most surprising was how the law enforcement agencies that tried to stop the proliferation of porn actually helped take it from the shadows into mainstream American culture. Cyber porn is a, is a you know, fancy word for porn on the internet. Cyberspace is the new frontier in the war against pornography. There's all sorts of material out there, some of it criminal. But because the internet is so vast, it's almost impossible to regulate. The internet is a natural for porn because of the anonymity. You don't have to go into the store and embarrass yourself. Former internet porn manager Evan Wright knows how easy it is to download porn from a home computer. It's also legal. ACLU president Nadine Strassen doesn't see that changing soon. The long-range consequences are not only that cyber censorship law will be unconstitutional, but I think even enforcing traditional obscenity laws online is very much in question now. There are legitimate crimes in cyberspace, from credit card fraud to child pornography. The smut needed a weapon. Nothing would be more powerful than the argument that porn was not only exploitative, it was actually murder. It was a very frustrating argument to porn veterans like Bill Margle. How many people do you think I could do that to and I start running out of people, or the word gets out, I'm butchering these people, how many people are going to come to casting calls if they know they're going to leave in different pieces? And it wasn't only the conservatives who were popularizing the snuff rumors. Hollywood had a part. The FBI file suggests that uh, one of the rumors of snuff films came from uh, Dennis Hopper. Dennis Hopper, the actor and director, allegedly told someone he'd seen a snuff movie when he was shooting a film in South America. The FBI also investigated Sammy Davis Jr., both leads went nowhere, and the search went on. I had probably the second best informant in the FBI on obscenity. Los Angeles having the best. I called this guy in and I said, uh, would you be willing to travel the country to find these? And if you can find them, buy them, bring them back. Sure. So I gave him a pile of money, which local police officers can't ordinarily do. He went to, I don't remember how many cities, but he covered the country pretty well. He was gone quite a while. He came back and he said, Kelly, it's strictly a rumor. He said, if they were out there, I'd have them for you. The problem is determining what's criminal and what's victimless fantasy. Whether it's kiddie porn that's actually animation or websites that paste celebrity heads on naked bodies. But chasing shadows isn't new in the battle against porn. Case in point, a 30-year wild goose chase that's ended in failure. The search for the snuff film. A snuff film is normally a hardcore porno film, except it has one difference at the end of it. And it's a big difference. A snuff film takes porn one terrible step beyond, ending with the actual murder of a performer on camera. No! Internet journalist Hogue Levins got the FBI's complete 103-page file on the snuff probe through the Freedom of Information Act. 
the FBI file suggests that the first documented uh, report of a snuff film occurred in 1969 on a beach in California. The snuff film on the beach was supposedly shot by Charles Manson and his family. No one ever found the film or could prove it was made, but those first whispers led the FBI to put Bill Kelly, its porn expert, on the case. As far as snuff is concerned, I was in it from the, the get-go. This is the way it was set up. Uh, a sergeant in mid-Manhattan Vice, New York City, had an underworld informant who came to him one day and he said, Sergeant Horman, there are allegedly a series of 8mm black and white motion picture films and one of the female participants is actually, truly murdered by having her throat slit. Now these films are allegedly for sale for $1,500. Do you want me to buy them if I can find them? Well, Horman called the FBI office in New York. He said, well, we don't know anything about it, but let me call that Irish guy down in Miami. He may be able to tell you something. And so they called me and they said, do you know anything about this? I'd never heard of it. Said, can you find out? I said, sure. I said, well, go ahead. The FBI's interest in snuff films is pretty clear. The concept that someone would actually film a murder. And in fact, some of the FBI agents we talked to suggested that actually finding a snuff film was like the holy grail. The snuff rumors spread at a time when pornography was playing to a larger audience. In the 70s, porn films like Deep Throat played in legitimate theaters. And with Hollywood making very edgy sexual films of its own, the groups that wanted to stamp out